So, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. And also, I want you to go over to 1 Thessalonians, the 4th chapter. I like Sunday evening because I like to have the liberty to preach what I feel that God is leading me to preach. And uh, for whatever reason, all last week, uh, I had uh, the rapture on my mind. I've been reading some things on pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture, mid-trib rapture, all this rapture, rapture, rapture. And I thought, well, what, what do... What do, do, do we feel and know about the rapture? In other words, uh, uh, does it matter when we think, uh, think the rapture is going to take place? Well, quite honestly, it doesn't matter because we're going to go through it if God determines the church is going to stay here. But from what I study and what I read in my own studies, I kind of feel that we're going to be out of here, that the church is going to be delivered from the wrath that is coming during this great tribulation period. I was watching a discussion, a debate last night uh, by an amillennial, a postmillennialist, and a historic premillennialist, and then a dispensational premillennialist, and all three of them had different views of the rapture. And... Uh, the dispensational premillennialist, of course, is pre-tribulation rapture. It's gonna, we're going to be taken out before the tribulation period. The historic premillennial guy believes that the church will go through the rapture and be purified during that time. And, of course, the post and ah, they don't know what they believe. They just believe that Israel's been replaced by us. That's pretty much where they are. But anyway, uh, I mean, they're really off the charts. But anyway, I thought I would uh, do a study uh, on Sunday evening on the rapture and, wh and what we see here uh, and, and what I feel that the Bible teaches in these particular areas. So in honor of God's word, I hope, I hope y'all are getting warm. Feels like a, I'm in an oven up here. I don't know how you feel back there, but Judy got her blanket off, so it must be getting nice in here. <laughs> All right, so anyway, turn to the 14th chapter of John, stand in honor of the reading of God's word, and this is a very precious passage of scripture that should be a, uh, a faith strengthener for the believer. We begin reading in verse 1, it says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. And he says, in my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you, speaking to believers in Christ. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and receive you unto myself. And that where I am, there you will be also. What a wonderful promise to the believer. Amen. Isn't, isn't that just an absolutely uh, precious passage of scripture? And then he says in verse 4, And whether I go, uh, you know, and the way you know. And then, of course, uh, I want you to turn also, if you're not there already, over to 1 Thessalonians. And what was taking place in Thessalonica was the Christians there were confused, kind of like Christians in America. Most of them have no idea what they know or what they believe. Well, anyway, these Christians, they were looking for immediacy, when it came to the return of Christ. And as time was passing by, all of a sudden they were having mothers and fathers that were dying, children that might die, spouses that might die. And all of a sudden they were very confused about the return of the Lord. So Paul was writing this scripture in order to... Uh, to kind of help them with their confusion about his return. And I want to begin reading with verse uh, 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, 
that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Who are the others that have no hope? Non-believers. What you have in the world are those that have hope through Christ and those that have no hope. That, that's what the world consists of. That's what humanity consists of. And, and that, that should be an inspiration for each of us to desire to witness to the folks that are lost and in need of a Savior. You know, God hadn't stopped working. We've just stopped working. Uh, we need to realize that uh, we need to share our faith with other people that have no hope. So if you have hope, these verses are for you. And uh, he says, for if we believe that Jesus died in verse 14 and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. He doesn't even use the term death here. He compares it to sleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together or snatched away or raptured out of this world, snatched out, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So comfort one another with these words. So I want you to be comforted with these words tonight if you're a believer. Father, we pray that you'd bless the reading of your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. First thing that we look at tonight is the promise of the rapture. So every theology believes in the rapture. It's just that they are very confused, many of them, in how they see the rapture and the timing of the rapture and the things that go along with it. But anyway, what is our attitude concerning these future events? The Lord said, let not your heart be troubled in verse 1. In other words, Jesus is saying, I know your lives are full of difficulties. And I know your lives are full of troubles. And he's saying, don't get wrapped up in those things, but look to me. In other words, when, when, when the going gets tough and when things seem to be out of sorts, and I was thinking about people uh, the older we get, the more things we go through. There's no question about it. Uh, the more health things we are faced with. Uh, in our younger days, we felt like we could conquer the world. And in our older age, we don't feel like we can conquer crawling out of bed in the morning sometimes. But the fact of the matter is, all of us, if we live long enough, will reach that point where we uh, need a comfort that's outside of the comfort we can bring ourselves. So if we get wrapped up in the things that, and the problems in our life, uh, we look to the Word of God and we look to the Holy Spirit to bring us comfort during these times. Now Jesus originally said these words to his disciples at the Last Supper, around the table at the Last Supper. Now Jesus uh, told them about his betrayer, in other words, he, he pointed out that he was going to be betrayed. And, of course, uh, Judas uh, exposed himself as the one who would betray him. And they had given up their lives, their work, their families. They had given up everything. They had walked away in order to follow Christ. Now, when they began to follow Christ, they assumed that he was the Messiah. They believed that he was the Messiah. But he was not the Messiah that they were looking for. They were looking for a conqueror. They were looking for one that would bring the people together and able to uh, get the boot heel off the throat of the Jewish people and lead the Jewish people to victory over Rome who had them under uh, persecution and under bondage. Now, this is who they thought Jesus was in the beginning. The food uh, they had given up their lives, their works, their families to follow Christ. Now, we as Christians are asked to give up the old things that we used to be so enamored with 
and so in love with in the world, uh, riches, uh, vacations, nice cars, uh, big bank accounts, uh, chasing the almighty dollar. And that's what many in the world do. But uh, we were asked not to, to give those things up, but that we had a new Lord in our lives. We had something different and much greater than what the world had to offer. Now, these uh, disciples had given up all of these things in order to follow Jesus, but they thought that they were going to be following someone that was going to be a conqueror, a military leader, who was eventually going to take over the government and then go against the Romans through the supernatural power of the Messiah, which was promised. But yet, he was going to present himself the first trip as what? As a suffering Savior, a suffering Messiah. In other words, he was going to be a lamb that would be led to slaughter. He would not be the, the lion that he will be on his return. Now, we should have a, a, a calm assurance when we read the Word of God uh, and what he has for his people. Uh, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and I'll receive you to myself. This is a promise to all those that will follow Christ and believe in Christ. Uh, and by the way, we're going to a place. Uh, we don't know for sure where that place is. I'm convinced that that place is just on the other side. I, I think uh, we'll step through when death comes to the other side. And I think that we're surrounded by... Uh, this third heaven that Christ preaches of, where but now it's a it's, it's the uh, realm of angels and demons, and it's a realm that the dead will go into when death takes place, and we can't possibly imagine what it's going to be like, but we fear the unknown. But Christ is saying, don't fear. The unknown. I go to prepare a place for you. And we're going to a place, Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. And I used to imagine that when I was a kid. The preacher would preach that and say, In my Father's house are many mansions. And I'd see all of these uh, homes, you know, like the old plantations with the pillars out in front of it. I'd see them sprinkled all over heaven. But that's not what that means at all. Matter of fact, I hate to admit this, but the NIV translates it much closer to what the translation should be. It says, in my father's house are many rooms. <laughs> I heard some old preacher say one day, he said, hallelujah, I want to tell you right now, when I go to heaven, I want a mansion. I don't want no room. Well, hey, you're going to get a room because that's exactly what the proper translation would be. In my father's house are many rooms. Now, it literally means dwelling places. In my father's house or many dwelling places. Now, usually when we think of mansions, we think of these palladial estates, and like I used to imagine these old plantation homes on the hill and all of that stuff, but uh, that's not what it's going to be. In reality, what the Lord has prepared for us will be beyond all of our ability to even comprehend. In other words, we can't in our minds possibly comprehend what God has in store for his elect. I mean, we can't possibly, our mind, Paul was a good example of that. Paul said, I knew a man, he's speaking of himself. He says, I knew a man that was caught up into the third heaven. And the third heaven uh, is the place of eternal dwelling, the place of God. And uh, he was caught up into a third heaven. And he and in his language could not even express how wondrous it was. He could not even in human terms express the wonders of this third heaven that he was caught up to. And that's what's waiting for us if we're in Christ. This is the comfort and the promise we have as believers. Usually when we think of mansions, we always think of these great estates and stuff, but it'll be prepared, a room or a place that is a dwelling place that's prepared for us. No one will be disappointed. I can most assuredly tell you that. So I wonder if we'll be living together in that room, Debbie. I doubt it. 
but you can have the desires of your heart, so I'm going to bring Willie on up with me. I'm just kidding, believe me. <laughs> but not only are we going to a place, but we're going to a person. We're going to a person. Jesus also says, I will come again and receive you to myself. So we're going to be received by Christ himself. I was talking to someone just recently about the supernatural or the other side and, uh, and, and things. Uh, it was actually Linda, Harold's uh, cousin, right? Uh, we were talking at the funeral home yesterday, and uh, she was talking about this balloon or something that was flying around in this office. It turned around and was looking, and she kind of, uh, the dentist uh, or the doctor or whoever it was, had told uh, told them that it was your aunt, Bessie. Aunt Bessie was was communicating with them. Now, I don't know if I go that far or not, but uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's pretty far. But, you know, strange things happen. Uh, I was talking about Michaela. When Michaela was uh, an infant, Sonny had passed away, and... Debbie would have Michaela on her lap. She was the cutest little old blue-eyed thing, had that little curly blonde hair. And, uh, I don't know what happened to her, Debbie, but anyway, we just need to pray about it. That's all we can do. She's still a sweet kid. But anyway, Michaela would sit on Debbie's lap, and she would go. And I thought, what does she see anyway? What in the world is she looking at? Well, I don't know. I know. There's a lot of mysteries. But one thing that's not a mystery, we'll see Jesus. When, when we pass to the other side, we'll see Jesus. And he says, I will come again to receive you to myself. He, he does not just say, I will come again and take you to heaven. No, it's going to be our Savior who receives us. He says, uh, I will receive you to myself and will en enjoy seeing him face to face. Man, is that going to be a time? I can't even imagine what that's going to be like. But we're not only going to be received by Jesus himself, but we're going to re be receiving a promise that he has given every believer. The Bible is filled with the promises of God. We can be assured that we will keep them all, including this one. Uh, this, is, th this doesn't stutter. It doesn't... Uh, uh, shadow anything there's no mystery to it he just flat out tells us we'll be taken we'll be face to face with him and it's a promise from God we can be assured that he'll keep that promise many promises to the disciples he said I will make you fishers of men I will build my church and now he says I will come again and we can be assured that all of these things have taken place or will take place. Now, we move to the explanation of the rapture of the church. There's going to come a generation and there's going to come a time when Jesus will come again. Now, these Christians in Thessalonica were very confused about what was going on. They were thinking, you know, why they were starting to doubt actually they were thinking why hasn't he come my mother died last week and we had a promise that that he was coming again so paul had written this letter in order to kind of straighten out some of the confusion that was taking place in thessalonica now the explanation of the rapture uh first off we see the mystery of the rapture. Uh, now it says in verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also uh, which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the mystery, well, it, it, it goes on, a little further down, it speaks of the mystery of the rapture. Uh, now, mystery 
here does not mean mysterious. There's nothing mysterious about the rapture. In the Bible, a mystery is something that had not been revealed before, but now could be known. Now, in the Old Testament, men believed that people came into God's presence by dying and then being raised again. But now it's revealed, this mystery, it's revealed that we shall not all sleep or we shall not all die. That's hard to imagine. Isn't it? There's going to be people that Christians, believers, that will not have to face physical death. You know, we, we think about death, and all of us are going to die because it's appointed to uh, man to die, and then judgment, the Bible tells us. But uh, when, you think about, when you think about dying, it, in the human mind, uh, apart from our faith in what the Bible teaches us, uh, we, in our minds, have a difficult time because it's unknown. And, and everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Well, the, the hardest thing about death is leaving behind those that you love. And uh, believe it or not, but no matter what one has accomplished in this world and in their life, some have become extremely successful and that success cannot be continued by another, but God will move to another area of success another does not fill the shoes of the one that's gone on but the bottom line is this the bottom line is anyone and everyone can be replaced on this earth I think about when I die my grandkids they'll remember me I don't know how they'll remember me but they'll remember me and they'll tell stories about Palgan and this, that, and the other. And, but as far as uh, me or someone replacing me, it doesn't matter because they'll move on. They'll move on and they'll have their own families, their own children, and eventually someday they'll become grandparents if the Lord chooses not to return anytime soon. So the cycle of life just continues to go on. And... Uh, <clears throat> uh, as, as I learned just recently, no one is irreplaceable. Uh, the new sign we're getting, where my name goes, it is peelable. So everyone is peelable. I don't care who you are, they can peel you right off and they can put someone else right on there. And that's the best example that I've seen that you can replace anyone. Yeah, I got tickled with old Lindsay. He said, oh, we'll just peel you right off and <laughs> put the new one up there. But anyway, that's, that's the way life is. I was thinking about Winston Sweeney the other day, Don. Old Winston, he served and got blood, sweat, and tears dedicated to that church all those years that he was up there. I don't know exactly how many years that he was there. But you know what he got for it in earthly rewards? He got his name put on a fellowship hall, the Winston Sweeney Memorial Fellowship Hall. And that's not. But anyway, you're not looking for earthly gain. You're looking for what awaits you. And your service to God will determine your rewards in heaven. We know that. But the greatest hope that we have is that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. We're going to be in his presence face to face. And then there's going to come a generation that's not going to have to worry about death. You know, I've heard people say, man, I hope I live to be 100. I hope I don't live to be 100. Man, 100-year-old people are ugly. I mean, you think if you've got, you got one bone of vanity, you don't want to get to be 100 because you look like an old prune walking around. As Red Fox said, ain't nothing uglier than a 100-year-old white woman. Well, I got news for them. There ain't nothing uglier than a 100-year-old. I don't care what race you are. But anyway, if you live to be 100, I want you to think about this just for a second. See, we want to plant our feet here on this earth now. We don't want to leave. We don't want to leave what we've accomplished behind. We don't want to leave our children behind, our grandchildren. We, we, we don't want to leave our spouses. We don't want to leave. We don't want to leave this place. But if you live to be 100, think about this. 
most of the people you love, including many of your children, your siblings, will go on way before you do. I remember a Twilight Zone that they had on back in the 60s one time about this history professor at this college and um, one of his students was looking at pictures from the Civil War and there he was. Well, the story goes on and it comes to the place where he, does, he can't die. He, he, he's going to live forever. He made a deal with the devil or something and he's going to live forever. And then finally when he's confronted about it, he talks about all of the wives he's had. All of the children that he's had that has died and gone on, and he just keeps moving on. It would be horrible to live forever. It would be horrible to live to be a hundred, I think. That, that's just my opinion. But a lot of folks think that that would be the thing to do. But the thing is, we as believers need to take comfort in what awaits us as believers. But there is going to come... A generation where people do not or will not die. Perhaps tonight. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we all got snatched out of here? I'm afraid there might be some of us left behind. I hope not. but I don't like to think that. It would be horrible if you guys just disappeared and I'm still standing up here. <laughs> that would be, that'd be rough, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't know how I justify that. So, anyway, like the Baptist church went in one morning and they had canceled services and the parking lot was empty. And the guy said uh, to his uh, wife, he said, the rapture must have come. She said, no, the Methodist church has still got a full parking lot full. He said, exactly, the rapture may have came. <laughs> All right, some of you will get that in a minute. But the mystery of the rapture. Uh, but now it's revealed we shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. Some won't have to die to go to heaven. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Wouldn't you love to be all wrapped up, maybe you're having a Thanksgiving dinner with all your family there, and God comes up and snatches you out of here with all your, the believers in your family, just takes you out all together. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? A story they tell here at church a lot is the fact that there was a, there was a couple that used to go here. Harold and Linda would know their name. I have no idea, but they were Sunday school teachers, I believe. Well, Frasers. And they always said that they prayed that they would go out together. And they did. They got hit with a truck, wasn't it? And they went out together, just like that. So their prayers were answered. They died at the same time. But anyway, there's going to come a time when Christians are going to be raptured or snatched out of here without having to face physical death. Now, some won't have to die to go to heaven. At the rapture, some will be living, and many will have died. And this is what Paul is presenting to these people in Thessalonica. But he goes on to say, we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. Man, I, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like to receive a new glorified body. I can't, can't imagine what it's going to be like. Stephen, you won't have any more dizziness, son. There'll be no more cancer. There'll be no more arthritis. There'll be no more getting shots in your eyes, Debbie and Ron. There'll be no more of that stuff because we're going to have a body like his body, we're told. A body of perfection, a body that doesn't get sick, a body which is going to live forever with our Lord and Savior. And let me tell you something else that I've thought about lately. I've thought about all of these millions of babies that have been killed in their mother's womb. They're going to be in heaven. They're going to be, they're already with the Savior. And they'll be known. I believe that they will be known. And if their parents, maybe down the road somewhere, through the grace and the mercy of God, became believers, they'll be reunited with that child that they murdered in their womb. Why? Because their sins were forgiven and their slate was wiped 
clean. And how they will rejoice when they'll get to see that baby that they aborted. And it's all through the grace of God and through Christ. Many will never see them again, unfortunately. But think about those things just for a moment. We'll be reunited with our loved ones. And uh, there's a process that takes place with the rapture. And you're going to have to wait till week after next to hear that, okay? Because I don't have time. It's too hot in here. And I know that's why they turn that heat up, so I won't preach more than 45 minutes. But that's all right. Uh, if I threw my coat off, I could go another hour. I just want you to know that. You're not intimidating me any. All right, let's stand up, if you will. <laughs> Max says, go on, preach, brother, preach. Isn't that right, Max? <laughs> Max says, I can handle another hour of that. <laughs> All right. I hope you all have a great week this week. Uh, we're on the slide now, going sliding down to Christmas time. It's going to be a busy time for our church, a busy time for our families. And uh, we just need to pray for good services during the Christmas season. And uh, I hope everybody uh, will have a great Christmas season. All right. Pete, would you close in prayer for us?